reports and images that we've seen, collapsed hospitals, crumbled homes, and men and women carrying their injured neighbors through the streets are truly heart-wrenching. It has been five days now since 4.53 Tuesday afternoon. A city shaken to its core, collapsing in a cloud of dust. The, the world is coming to an end. The anguish was immediate. <laughs> and would only get worse and worse. It has been a horrifying week here in Port-au-Prince, a week where the dead, the injured, and the homeless are sharing a city largely reduced to rubble. A week where people had to fend for themselves, desperate for food and water, tending to their own injuries, burying their own dead. It is only now that aid is finally starting to arrive. But it's taken five days, very long days. A major disaster may be unfolding right now in Haiti, hit today by a powerful earthquake. It was From early on, it was clear the death toll would be staggering. First, we heard tens of thousands, then potentially hundreds of thousands. The first words from Haiti's ambassador to the United States were prophetic. Uh, I'm quite sure we will need everything. The pictures have become familiar. The presidential palace had all but collapsed. So had block after block, neighborhood after neighborhood, gone. A police station destroyed. The university flattened. We need more people down here. United Nations headquarters gone. The few helpers that remained had to help themselves. Everywhere there were frantic efforts to pull people from the debris. Tons of debris. The few happy endings offset by horrific scenes on corner after corner. Port-au-Prince was on its own. As the sun rose on Wednesday, the earthquake's impact could be seen not just in the city, but in surrounding neighborhoods. In the best of times, Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Four out of five people here live in poverty. With hospitals collapsed and no doctors or ambulances in the streets, people realized it was up to them. Right now we're outside a hospital. It is an almost indescribable scene of anguish with bodies lying in the street and people looking for help in any way they can. Right now there just isn't enough help available. Too many people die. There's no help, no hospital, no electricity, nothing. No food, no food, no food, no water, nothing. There's too many That was a cry that would be heard throughout the city for days to come. This woman led us into the back of what was left of her home. We ran, we ran, and we made it to here. And as when we came right here at this point, that's when it collapsed. She had Thank barely God gotten God her God children God. out alive. So you... And as we um, spoke with her... You have six children? Is it? Oh my God. Get out, get out, get out. Go, 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 go. The earth shook again. She has you. She has you. We just had to leave the building because there was an aftershock so everyone who was inside had to come back out you can see the concern is obvious on the streets right now they don't want these buildings to keep shaking they're worried about even more aftershocks a well-justified worry Haiti there are just absolutely no building standards John Hasse is with the aid organization World Vision buildings are built on top of buildings and there are no standards so it's just unreinforced concrete going up I've heard it many times, buildings are what kill people, and there's just no, all the buildings are falling in. The world began to respond. Across the United States, in Europe and Asia, search and rescue teams mobilized. In Port-au-Prince, a Coast Guard plane surveyed the city. The airport started filling up with planes. By nighttime, 24 hours after the quake, rescue squads were finally going into action. The only certainty was that they had an enormous job ahead. The tragic thing is we have no idea how many people have died. And still the living, homeless and outdoors, tried to keep their spirits up. To the people of Haiti, we say clearly and with conviction, you will not be forsaken, you will not be forgotten. 
But for the wounded of Port-au-Prince, it was surely hard not to feel forsaken. Correspondent Byron Pitts found a collapsed hospital with a staff of one. How, how are you supposed to take care of hundreds of people by yourself? Well, that's what we're trying to do right now. I'm here at the end of the world. That's right. The crushing injuries of earthquakes are especially brutal. And Dr. Tyrone Gill told us that three days without medical care is close to a death sentence. But these are people that have been, in, you know, um, buried for what, three, four days. And so when they get here, you, know, you have like gangrene and that type of stuff going on already. Gangrene? Yeah, You're so. seeing it already? Uh, oh, exactly. That's what I'm saying. So when they reach here, we, can't, we have another choice to amputate. Amputate? Yeah. By the time they bring someone here, you have to amputate? Yeah. We saw desperate scenes across the city. For those trapped, time was running out. A lucky few made it to the airport and onto flights out of Haiti. As for the incoming, the stream of aid had become a flood. We uh, in Jordan and uh, under His Majesty's uh, directives uh, joined the international community in expressing our sympathy uh, to the people of Haiti. And... But the tarmac was turning into a traffic jam. So many planes and not enough room. The collapsed presidential palace became a symbol for the collapse of government authority. Given the aid logjam, some turned to looting. Mattresses became a most valuable commodity. President of Haiti, Rene Preval, reflected on his country's dire straits. A lot of people died. A lot of people are suffering. By Friday, aerials of Port-au-Prince showed just how severe the devastation was. About one-third of its buildings had been damaged or destroyed. The view from above showed the living, 300,000 homeless, and the dead. With temperatures rising into the upper 80s, the smell of death hovered over the city. Some bodies were burned in desperation. Yet still, there were small victories. A woman was pulled from the rubble of the Montana Hotel. I said, thank you all for saving my life. Thank you. And the injured continue to fight. Among them, many children. Nearly half the population of Haiti is under the age of 18. His, his, his family died, his friends. His friends died. Katie Couric found a hospital bursting at the seams and one desperate little boy. 13-year-old Pierre LaRousse with a broken leg and a head injury. The boy held on tight, waiting for his grandmother to make her way to his side. Why? Why? At week's end, that question, why, was on the minds of so many Haitians. With a massive outpouring of international support, why was it taking so long? Still, there was hope on the horizon. The U.S. aircraft carrier Carl Vinson began launching helicopters, bringing in precious supplies of water. But there was no way to get it to all of the people. What's your biggest challenge right now? Our biggest challenge is um, being able to logistically distribute items in a secure manner. Holly Inuretta was organizing sacks of hygiene kits and food for Catholic Relief Services. Does the situation get worse before it gets better? It does get worse because as aid is having trouble getting to the people, the people get more anxious. We went along as supplies were delivered to the home of Lily Drace, who had welcomed 230 families into her backyard. I went and told them, listen, come. You have nowhere to go, you can come. And then I have all those people since then. Finally, yesterday, the pace of relief picked up. Food and drink began to reach the desperate crowds of Port-au-Prince. U.S. Navy helicopters began making dozens of trips every hour to deliver water. What's the priority right now? Uh, the priority, without question, is alleviating the suffering of the Haitian people who have suffered this incredible disaster. And right now, their biggest need is water. In one neighborhood, water came by the tanker truckload. In another, U.N. workers handed out plates of food. Much needed relief, but the threat of chaos remains. And the need is not just in Port-au-Prince. Correspondent Kelly Kobiea went to Leogang, a nearby town now all but destroyed. 
The priest at the 500-year-old Catholic Church does not know what he will say at today's Mass. God only knows. If only God knows. And only God knows the fate of patients still searching through collapsed homes, still lying in the streets, still looking for a place to bury their dead, or the unimaginable horror of a woman still trapped in the rubble. Five days and counting, and Haiti is still crying for help.